prayer that we're supposed to pray. One of the major aspects of that prayer is not just to ask for forgiveness for ourselves, but to also ask God for the strength to forgive those who have sinned against us. This is central. The idea of forgiveness is central to Jesus' ministry and who he is in his kingdom. And, uh, and we have to understand this and get this if we are going to be his followers. That's why we are focusing on this. It's because it's important that we focus on it if we're actually going to do and be his people. But the problem is, is that when we take this passage, like so many parables, we will just take them and we'll just read them just like Thomas did. And we'll be like, okay, that's a really good story. But we have to read it in the context of the fullness of what Jesus is talking about in order to really truly grasp what he is talking about. Because it's, it's hard to, uh, to, to understand the fullness of Jesus' vision for forgiveness if we don't know the context. And so the context really begins uh, with a different question at the beginning of this chapter. At the beginning of chapter 18, there's a, there's a question that's raised of who is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus brings this little child to the center of, of whatever gathering is taking place. And he sets this child down in front of everyone and says, this is the, the, the picture of greatness in the kingdom of God. You must become like a child. You must become like this Innocent, trusting, humble, most needy person among us. If you want to truly be great in the kingdom of heaven. If you don't think that Jesus loves children and has a high value and opinion of children, you're crazy, right? And that's why you should all volunteer in children's ministry next week, right? Because <laughs> you want to see greatness, it's over there, right? I know some of you wrestle with greatness every day, uh, so... I get it. I get it. But here's the deal, right? This, this is the context of what Jesus is laying out. He's saying basically, here's the deal. He's saying that when we fail to live in this innocent way, in this trusting way, in this humble way, in this needy way, when we become self-reliant and self-sufficient, what ends up happening is we end up actually hurting people. Because we begin to put our values and our needs above others and we begin to come into this idea of, of how um, you know, we want to live life and all the things that we want to do and, and all of that kind of stuff. And ultimately the result is failure and failure oftentimes doesn't just hurt us, it hurts many other people around us. And that's why then Jesus moves to about in the middle of this chapter, he talks about dealing with conflict and how to deal with conflict. In the church and in the community of believers and and he gives a systematic way of how you should handle situations that don't go well or when you're at odds with someone else who is in faith and then that brings us to the story that we're in today so you have this idea of what greatness actually looks like in the kingdom and then what ends up happening when when that greatness is compromised and we fail and, and then there's a, there's a series of conflict resolution that takes place. And then that's when Peter steps up in his boldness and says this. He says, this question that, that begins this story and this parable for Jesus. And he asks the question of, like, how, mu how, how, how much should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven times? And you can almost hear it in Peter's voice that he's thinking to himself, I'm really going above and beyond here, Jesus. Like, I, I'm going to forgive more than most people are willing to forgive. Seven times? And Jesus says, oh, no. Not seven times. But 77 times. And I'm kind of, when I was reading this, I'm like, does, why does Jesus just multiply the number by 11? Is 11 Jesus' favorite number? Like, I'm, I'm wondering. Like, he's like, because he's number one, he wants two number ones. I don't know. Like, is it like, I don't. But what he's doing, and, and I, he's, he's actually referred, referring back to an old story. There are two times that these numbers are associated with one another in the scriptures. And this is one of them, 7 and 77. The other time 7 and 77 show up and are associated with one another is in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, we get this story of two brothers. And you may know these two brothers. You may know this story of Cain and Abel. And Cain uh, is, is angry and he's frustrated and he's, he's not happy that God is accepting 
Abel's sacrifice and not his. And so he, uh, he, he gets in this like fit of rage. And God comes to him and says, you need to be careful. Be careful. Get control of yourself because sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. This is really, really key. That sometimes, like, we have, to, we have to realize that sin is just right there lurking, waiting for you to mess up, waiting to take you. In, in Cain, he lets sin take him, and he kills his brother Abel. And at that point, Cain gets really kind of frustrated and upset, and he says, you know what, I'm gonna, I want to die, so I'm going to leave the presence of God. It's kind of his deal. I'm just going to roam the earth away from the presence of God until someone shows up and kills me. But God's not going to let him off that easy. And so he basically puts a mark on Cain so that no one will kill Cain or mess with him. And they say, and he, and he basically puts a mark on them that helps people understand that if you try and do anything to Cain, seven times the vengeance will come upon you. Seven times what you try to do to him will happen to you. And so Cain, he's living, and he has this little boy. His little boy's name is Enoch, and he decides he's going to build a city. And uh, this city, he names after his little boy, Enoch. And Enoch was like the worst place to live. No one wants to live there. It was horrible. A wretched city full of people just like Cain, full of people who are murderers, people who hated authority, who hated the righteousness and justice of God. And one of these people was named Lamech. And Lamech, at the end of chapter 4, he's wooing some women by singing a song. Um, and he's talking about how great he is. And he's arrogantly bragging about how this young boy came and tried to hurt him. And he did not give the vengeance of Cain, which is seven times. But he gave something far greater. He gave 77 times the vengeance. And he sings this song about... This great vengeance that he has on anyone who tries to hurt him. And so what Jesus is doing here, I mean, it's like deep biblical, theological, like I'm going to dig into the archives and I'm going to pull out like a really good one for you, Peter. But the way that most people see vengeance and the way that most people look at taking vengeance as taking vengeance into their own hands and going above and beyond as far as I want because I've really been hurt. That's how my followers are called to forgive. My followers are called to forgive in the same way and be marked by this forgiveness in the same way that other people often take vengeance into their hands and brag about it. I'm calling you to find a way to forgive, but not just forgive, but go above and beyond. To forgive. And so there is something really, really clear here that Jesus is saying. And yet the way it's been interpreted has not always been so clear and it's not been so well thought out and laid out for people in the church. Because Jesus is clearly saying that if you are one of his followers, you are marked by his forgiveness and should always forgive those. Who have wronged you due to the immense forgiveness you have received from Christ. That's clear in this story, in this parable. It's clear that this is a call and a mark of genuine discipleship. But there are a lot of things that when this passage is taken. And it's just taken out of context. Of all of Matthew 18. What ends up happening is people end up being hurt. Or they get continually hurt. Or they, they, they feel like a wretch. Because they just can't forgive like Jesus says, we have to forgive. And this is, this is really key. It's really key to understand what Jesus is saying and what he's not saying. He is saying we have to forgive. But here's what he's not saying. He's not saying to forgive, you have to be a doormat. He is not saying that. If you look at the context of this passage... Forgiveness is not something that's set up to allow people who are guilty to continue to walk all over the innocent and the weak. What you're called to do, if you go back up and you look at the, the, the larger part in context of chapter 18, is you go and you have a conversation. That's the first step. 
that you go and you have a conversation with the person who has hurt you and offended you. You don't let it just continually go. You don't just lay down and say, well, I'll just lay down and let them walk all over me. I'll forget. No, you go and you confront them. And you let them know that they have sinned. And that they need to apologize at the very least. And, and here's, the, here's kind of the interesting thing, because I, I've read some books on this and, and thought about this. It, if you've been really hurt by someone, the thought of going and confronting that person is so frightening, isn't it? It's so frightening. I mean, think about those who I know in this room have dealt with Physical abuse, mental and emotional abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse. And you're telling me that I have to go confront that person in order to get to forgiveness? And here's, here's something I really think is key. I think the answer to that is yes, but it doesn't mean you have to be unsafe. You can find a public place to confront that person where you feel safe and secure. And then you can also follow the other things that Jesus talks about here in Matthew 18 on how to deal with conflict. You can bring someone with you. You can bring a community of people with you. I don't think Jesus is saying you just become a doormat, you just forgive, you just get walked all over. I don't, think he, I, I don't think that he's more concerned that you forgive as opposed to your safeness either. And I think it's really important to understand that. Because I think for a really, really long time, this, this passage has been taught, well, you just have to forgive. You've got to find it in your heart to forgive. But what, what many people miss when that's all that they lay out for the followers of Jesus to do is the immense pain and hurt and struggle that it takes to be in the room with the person who has hurt you. Not to mention, if you have actually been abused in one of those ways, the deep wounds that are caused in the fear for your own safety. And so I want you to understand, Jesus is not more concerned that you forgive than that you are safe. And I think that's one of the many reasons why he gives us the church and he gives us the community that we can have a safe place and people who can keep us safe and encourage us along the way as we try and follow what he calls us to and forgive. He's not more concerned about you forgiving than he is your safety. He wants both. He wants you to be safe and he wants you to be able to forgive. He also is not saying that when you forgive someone that you are going to just reconcile with them. Forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. And that's important as well, because I think a lot of times we think that forgiveness means reconciliation, and it doesn't. Not in every situation. There are certain situations where reconciliation is not probable, and it's probably not even a good, th- it's not even a good thing. Because it will just continually... Continually drive and hurt your heart. But you should also know that it doesn't mean that you have to continually associate with these people either. That you don't, you don't have to associate with or maintain a relationship with a person that's hurt you in order to forgive them. Now, that doesn't mean you ignore them, but it doesn't mean you necessarily spend time with them. And so forgiveness is is not that you become a doormat. It's not that you should be unsafe. It's not that you should reconcile in every single situation. It is not that you should continue to associate with people who have hurt you in a deep way. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is something that happens in our heart, which is we're going to talk about in a second. Because at the, at the end of this passage, or this section, where he talks about conflict resolution, Jesus gives um, a clear direction for those that you actually do confront, and who don't see the error of their ways, and who don't ask for forgiveness, or don't think that they've done anything wrong. 
and his, his instruction is to treat them like the tax collectors and the pagans. Now, I want to be clear what this means. This does not mean kick them out. How did Jesus teach tax collectors and pagans? Tax collectors and pagans is not like code for like sinner beyond ability to be saved. Just so you guys know. Like when you read that in the scripture, that's not what it says. It's just, it's, it's just outlining people who are not following God. Following his rule, his reign, where he is not the authority of which they adhere to. What does Jesus do to those people? He treats them like people who don't know. Instead of people who do. And what I'm saying is you can't expect people who don't know or who aren't following Jesus, to live like followers of Jesus. You just can't. You have to treat them as people who aren't following Jesus because they're not. And they're showing that they're not by the way they're behaving. They're showing they're not by the way that they are unwilling to ask for forgiveness or feel like they've done anything wrong. And so whenever someone does that, you just treat them as you would treat anyone else who doesn't know. And hopefully you enlighten them to the hope of the gospel. <laughs> and in light of the gospel, in light of having a master who forgives them greatly, they might see the error of their ways. And they might eventually come around to know how, how to own up to what they've done and ask and give an apology. But I want to talk about this story because this story is really interesting to me as well, right? Not just the, the aspects of forgiveness, but like the story itself is really interesting because Jesus tells a story about two servants and one of the servants is a servant of a master that he cannot pay back. And Jesus uses this outlandish term that he expects people to laugh at when he tells this story. He says 10,000 bags of gold. 10,000 bags of gold is 200 years of wages for the common person, right? So take whatever the average annual salary is in Holly Springs, which I think right now is around sixty-five to $70,000 a year, and it's 200 years of that. So times that, whatever you want to do. Do you guys do the math? I'm not a math person, okay? So you guys do the math. But the reality, it's a lot of money that no one could ever dream to pay back. No one will live long enough to make that kind of money to pay back. And so, and so Jesus is saying something that just seems outlandish. All of his people that are listening would have been like, what? That's crazy. How did he get in debt that bad? No one could get in debt that bad. That's not even possible. You know I mean? They're like, they're like just... But he's saying that what the, what the servant does, he gets down before the master, he begs, he begs for his forgiveness, he begs that, that him, he not be sold and his family not be sold, but, but that he can work until it's all paid back, which he'll never be able to do. The master knows it, the servant knows it. He'll never be able to earn it. He'll never be able to work it out. And the master says, well, how about this? How about I just cancel it all together? I just want to settle my debts. I mean, it, it, that's what it says in the passage. It says, I want to settle my debts. And so it's just really an interesting, an interesting aspect of, of how the master settles his debts. He just forgives them. And this is what Jesus does for us, right? I mean, this is the idea that this is, this is our story, Right? The story that we sung about during that first song, my testimony, from death to life. That's what we were. We were walking around dead in our sin and Jesus in his grace and in his love and his mercy comes and saves us. He, he cancels the debt and puts it on himself and pays the price that we are supposed to pay. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And then the story, and that's where we want the story to end, right? Like, I just, I wrote it in my Bible. Like, I want the story to end there. Can we just have the story in there? That's a really good ending. But it talks about how that servant goes to another servant. It says fellow servant in the scripture, which is interesting because he is reporting to a master and here is an equal reporting to an equal. And, and Jesus says this equal comes to 
this guy who owes him what is the equivalent of about, I don't know, $10,000, something like that, in comparison to what he owes the master. A very, very small amount of money in comparison. And he says, you need to pay me. And the, 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 the servant looks at the other servant and says, I can't. I, like, please, let me work for it. And he goes, no. You're going to prison. That's a really key turn in the story because the master looked at the servant and said, I'm going to sell you and all that you have to pay back your debt and you'll work it off. This is the way that bond servant worked in, in, the, in, in like the biblical time, right? Like they would sell themselves until they worked long enough to pay off the debt and then the debt was forgiven and they were free. Well, so this is how it works. This servant doesn't even, he just throws him in prison. What can you not do when you're in prison? You can't work to pay back the debt. Which shows the dark insidious nature of where we are a lot of the time as human beings. That as human beings, not only are we not willing to let other people try to work off whatever it is we feel like that they owe us or however it is they've hurt, we are so hurt we want them to hurt worse. And so we don't even give them a chance. We don't even give them the time of the day. We just become, what, what I see oftentimes happens in our, in our culture is we either become really aggressive like this and we just throw them in prison or we become passive aggressive and we just stop showing up to things. And both are just horribly, horribly bad, bad ways to follow Jesus <laughs> and to really come to grips with how much we've been forgiven. And I love how this story starts, right, with, with, with Peter saying, seven times is enough. What that tells me is that even when we overestimate how much we've been forgiven, we've underestimated how much we've been forgiven. Even when we overestimate, we underestimate the grace of Jesus Christ. That's something powerful about that, that we have to understand. But Jesus says, if we treat people the way that this servant treats his fellow servant, what's going to, be hap what's going to happen is we're going to be thrown into hell. He doesn't mix words. Jesus doesn't often mix words. And he says, if you do this, if you fail to remember how great you've been forgiven, this is, this is what you will receive. So we, he says, so, so, so the kingdom is a place where people forgive their brother and sister in their heart. Now this, this word heart um, is really important in the text because the Bible doesn't have a word for brain. Did you guys know that? The biblical authors did not have a word for brain. They didn't know. They didn't have any concept that our thoughts and ideas came from a different place than our passions, desires, and emotions. They didn't. So they use the word heart a lot throughout the Bible. Just go look. It's, it's in there all the time, right? But what it's talking about is the deepest, most genuine, authentic place of who you are, where you are actually the person that God has created you to be deep within, where all the masks are off, where all of, all of the things you try and hide are taken away and stripped. It's just your authentic place of who you are at your deepest core. That's what the Bible's talking about. It's saying from that place we have to be able to forgive. And it's so much more than just a simple I forgive you uttered while still steaming after an earlier fight. It is something that takes time, probably more time than we want. It takes a lot of contemplation, like a lot of like wrestling. It takes hard work to forgive the way Jesus calls us to forgive. And often it happens over counseling and professional avenues that truly 
Help us embody this call to forgive. Mallory was telling a story. Um, my wife, those of you who don't know us, um, she was telling me a story while we were on vacation last week about how this woman had her husband had cheated on her, and she they they ended up reconciling. Praise God. Um, but she went to a counselor. And the counselor said, all right, I want you to write down all the ways in which he violated your trust, sinned against you, whatever. And then she gave her a roll of tape, red tape, and said, I want you to cover it up. Cover up all of them. Because you have to realize that Jesus still loves your husband And his blood still covers all the ways in which he sinned against you. And you have to also write out your list. And you have to cover it up. And remember that everything you've ever done has been covered by the blood of Jesus. And Jesus forgives you. It's these kinds of deep practices that it will take in order to truly find a way to forgive. It is not something that happens quickly. And so you can say in your head and in your heart, I forgive that person. I just hope they burn in hell, right? Like <laughs> probably need to get some work done there. I've been there. I've been there. Recently, I had somebody in this church ask me to have lunch with them. And they did what Matthew 18 says do. They came and they talked to me about some way in which I had hurt them. And I apologized. Because I had hurt them. And I had lied to them. And the fact of the matter is, I, I, I didn't just lie. I'm a liar. And the fact of the matter is, you're not just... You didn't just commit adultery. You're an adulterer. And you didn't just sin. You're a sinner. You understand? It's ingrained in who we are without the grace of Jesus Christ. And so it is only by His power and His authority and His blood that we can forgive. Because He's the only one who's done it perfectly. He's the model of perfect love and compassion and forgiveness. You know, on June 17th, 2018, at Emanuel Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina, a young man named Dylan Ruth walked into a Wednesday night prayer meeting and he waited for it to finish. And then he opened up gunfire on the members of that gathering killing nine people. Mostly people, not just who were Christians, but who were also black. And two days after that shooting, the family members and the victims of the victims were given a chance to speak to Dylan. Two days. Not a lot of time. To address the actions And the hurts and this woman, Nadine Collier, the daughter of a 71-year-old woman who was shot and killed in cold blood that night, stood up and she said these words. She said, I forgive you. I want everyone to know that. You took something very precious away from me. I will never get to talk to her again. I will never get to hold her again. But I forgive you. And have mercy on your soul. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. But if God forgives you. I forgive you. 
that, that is someone that we should all aspire to be like. Because that is someone that truly knows the depths of the grace of Jesus Christ. And that he can forgive. He can forgive the greatest of hurts and pains that have been afflicted upon us. But he also forgives the hurts and pains that we inflict ourselves. And that's why each week, each week we come to this table. Every week we we take the bread and the cup to remember. This is what Jesus says. He says, do this to remember. And so as we come to the table, what it is, it's a time to take the bread and it's time to take the cup. It's time to take the body and the blood of Jesus and remember and confess and ask for forgiveness and ask for these things, this body and this blood poured out on our behalf to be always in our hearts and in our minds. That we might be able to forgive others. And so today as we go to the table. The tables are two right back here on each side of the sound booth. And two up front on each side of the stage. And as you go to the table and you take the body and you take the blood. Just find your way back to your seat. And just sit down. Spend maybe a few moments confessing. Spend a few moments asking for forgiveness. Spend a few moments maybe thinking about someone that you need to forgive. And let the blood and the body of Christ, the gospel, the good news that we are all set free by his sacrifice, by his payment of our debt. Let that good news just wash over you like a wave again and again and again. Let's pray. God, thank you for, thank you for your love and your grace. God, I pray I pray that we can forgive we can come to grips with the depth of the forgiveness you have given us with the power that is made manifest in your broken body and your shed blood I pray that we can recognize our failures And that your prayer that you call us to pray every day doesn't just get thrown out there flippantly. But when we ask for you to forgive our sins, God, that we be able to name them. We be able to recognize them. We be able to wrestle with them and hand them over. God, I pray that as we pray that you not just forgive us, but that you allow us to forgive those who have sinned against us. God, that we'll keep in view your grace, your mercy, your kindness. God, we we all need it more. We all need it more. Let us come to you, the only one who can give it, and find rest and peace and hope and healing. In Jesus' name, amen.